Hey, I think we're live. So let's just move things in here a little bit. <clears throat> so remember, this is going to be where what we want to talk about is puppy problems. So that's really the theme of this one. Um, at the end of this, if you've got general questions, we'll, we'll tackle those. But what we want to talk about today is puppy problems. And um, <clears throat> yeah, let's see if anybody can see us here. So uh, I'm hoping that we're going here. If somebody can give me a uh, thumbs up, I'll know there's people out there. All right, Marty's here, good. So, um, right, we've got people coming in, good. Quite a few people, glad to see that. So um, let's just start talking about some of the things we should be worrying about. So, you know, what can go wrong with puppies? Um, so somebody's got a whelping question, natural birth, how long before uh, into and after puppies is born? and how to handle the umbilical cords. Okay, so let's start talking about those things. So if, if you are there for the birth, if this is gonna be a natural birth, then you, know, you can help the mum. If you've got a stuck puppy, you can help get a puppy unstuck. One of the things that you absolutely should have on hand is Vaseline, because the moment that you start to see impending labor is the time to go get a good dollop of Vaseline and get that all up inside the, uh, the bitch is vulva as best you can to help grease things up. So you know, if you see a puppy that's being presented, got a bulge at the back end, you can go get yourself a towel, get your hands so they're not slippery, and help pull that puppy out in an arc towards the floor. So if the dog is standing, standing on all fours, you'd pull that puppy down an arc towards the floor. When that puppy comes out, it'll probably be attached to the placenta. And what you want to do is get some... Um, dental floss and tie that off as close to the puppy's belly as you reasonably can and then cut off the ex excess so the placenta and all the other muck you just basically throw away. So some people say that they give that to the mother because it can help stimulate contractions. Uh, when we were doing a natural welts we didn't. I think it can upset mum's stomach. So if it was me I'd just chuck those away and get rid of them. Um, so what's the next thing that you got to do? Well the things that go wrong are puppies get cold. Uh, so the very first thing you got to do is get the umbilical tied off, get the placenta removed, get this puppy in a towel, get it roughed up, get it dry. And if you can hold the puppy's head towards the floor as you're doing this, then the amniotic fluid that's in their lungs will drain out, which is the, the, the next step towards getting that puppy taking its first breath. So, and it can be a bit worrisome sometimes. I mean, you know, especially with C-sections, so the same process, you've got to get the puppy dried off, you've got to get the puppy breathing. And with a C-section, because the puppies had some of the, of the anesthesia from mum, they could be pretty sluggish for five, even 10 minutes. Typically with a natural whelp, puppies come out crying almost right away. But in either case, you've got to get the fluid out of the lungs. So the very first thing to do is get yourself a towel and start really rubbing that puppy's back while it's upside down. Sammy, show me something here. Good. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, Pat, by the way, Tammy, say hi. Hey. Tammy's got flu. No, so, cold. well, a cold, whatever. So she's not here. Sorry about that. So she apologizes for not being present, but she's, uh, she's feeling pretty rough. Anyway, get these puppies warmed up as quick as you can. Get them taking their first breaths. The moment that a puppy has been taking some breaths, you can start whining with the next puppy if one's being produced. So in a C-section, what we do is, first puppy out is the first one we start working on. And we keep working on that puppy until either it's taken a breath, in which case it goes into the incubator, or the next puppy is here and that puppy, the first puppy hasn't taken a breath yet. So we, we, we're not gonna spend all of our time on the very first puppy, and that puppy's got problems, and it's 10 minutes later, and we've got puppies stacking up, and we haven't taken care of any of the other puppies. So you know, be, manage your time well on this, because you want to get a puppy breathing within 10 minutes of it being born. If it's more than 10 minutes, it could still make it, but it's unlikely that it's gonna make it. It's probably got problems. So don't get stuck in the situation. You, know, you can go back to that puppy that wasn't breathing after you've got the next one going. But the, and hopefully you've got more than one person helping you as well, because the more people have got on board, then the more you can do it. Someone's got 10 puppies here, they're two weeks old, and notice that the puppies have a, re a runny nose. What should I do? Okay, well this is, 
This is the precursor to pneumonia. So what's going on here? So the typical cause of this is not because they've caught a cold, it's because they've got milk inhalation. What's happened is, is they've got some milk that rather than going down into their stomach, has gone into their lungs. And that has now started up a bacterial infection which then develops into pneumonia. And these puppies can go downhill very, very quickly. So, if you've got a puppy that's got a runny nose, you've got to immediately assume that pneumonia is potentially what you're going to be facing. And what do you do for pneumonia? An incubator, oxygen, antibiotics. Those are the things to do. So probably the very first thing to do is, if you don't have any antibiotics, you're going to have to go get a script for that, which means you're going to have to go to the vet, and the vet will diagnose this. You can do this yourself. Um, if you've got some, um, a stethoscope, you can listen to that puppy's lungs, and you can compare it to the other puppies. And what you're going to hear here is kind of a crackling noise. You won't hear a nice, even whoosh of air as the puppy's breathing, but it'll be more of a crackling noise. That's the first sign that maybe pneumonia is going on. So a runny nose, crackling so si signs on the stethoscope. Those would all be signs of pneumonia. Time to get antibiotics on board. Typically, you're going to treat with clavamox, which is basically a, a form of amoxicillin for puppies. It comes in a powder you mix with water. It makes kind of a pink liquid. You're going to give that daily for about eight to 10 days. Um, also, a good idea to have an aspiration bulb on hand so that you can suck out any muck and junk from their mouth and their nose to help them breathe better. If they're really having problems, they can go cyanotic, they can go blue. That's the time that definitely, that, by the time that has happened, or maybe before that's happened, to get those puppies on oxygen. So what we do is we have an oxygen concentrator. Don't have to have bottles. Don't have to have oxygen bottles, which you have to have a prescription for. And by the way, we do sell oxygen concentrators at My British Supply. They're about 470 bucks, I think. They make oxygen directly out of the air. So they work forever. So what we do is we go get a cup. We put a hole in the end of the cup, pass the tube from the oxygen concentrator from outside the cup to inside the cup, put the puppy's head inside the cup, put the cup in the incubator, and turn the oxygen on the lowest setting. So I've got a lot of people asking, what should the setting be on an oxygen concentrator? The answer is the lowest setting. Remember, these things are designed for human beings. So me as a 190 pound person might need six liters a minute, but the, um, the machines that we sell will go up to seven liters a minute, but they don't produce as strong an oxygen flow. It's not as concentrated than they are at one liter a minute. And one liter a minute is fine for an entire um, litter of puppies. So one liter a minute, put it on the lowest setting. Okay. Uh, let's have a look here. That was that one there. Um, Emic Chicago says, I, have a, I got, had an emergency C-section. My puppies came out two days. Then this morning, one passed away. But someone said this might have a, that uh, um, pneumonia might be the cause. Well, okay, so let's talk about premature puppies and, what, and, and, and deaths in puppies and what can go wrong. Cold. So that is the, 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 the things that you completely have control over would be puppies getting cold, puppies getting squashed. So you've got to set up an environment for your puppies, whether they're naturally born or by C-section, so that they can keep warm. And so some people use heat lamps. I'm not crazy about that. It's Mum's already too hot. She's got a fur coat on. She doesn't like the heat lamp. It's close to her. Not crazy about heat lamps, but it's better than nothing. The next thing that people do is they put a heat pad underneath the entire mum on the babies. Um, that's okay. I'm still not crazy about that. Heat pads that are inside the area where mummies can get cords chewed you can electrocute a dog. And also you've got the same problem. Mum's getting the heat, she doesn't really like it. So what we recommend is what we sell at My Breeder Supply, which is this heat tape that goes around the periphery of the cage under the floor, and it produces heat only in the area where the pig rail is. Pig rail's there, which is basically nothing more than a piece of pipe that's around the inside edge of your whelping box to stop puppies and get squashed. The idea behind this is, is that mum will fall asleep she will move around in her sleep, and she can back a puppy up all the way against the wall where they get trapped. If you've got a pig rail there, mum's back hits the pig rail first, which leaves a gap for the puppies to move around so the puppies can escape. So, fundamental to this is pig rail and heat. Um, now, what could have gone wrong with your puppies? Well, could be pneumonia, could be milk inhalation, a little bit early for that to develop at two days. 
Uh, a very likely thing is, is the puppies maybe were taken a bit early. If you take puppies more than two days early on a C-section, their lungs are not developed properly, and then you'll start losing puppies. Puppies typically something around 48 to 72 hours, you'll start losing puppies, and you can lose an entire litter over this. So it's very, very, very important that you do get your timing right, and I preach this all the time. And please don't rely on your vets for this. Make sure that they are getting it right. You know, you've got to be proactive about this. Lots of vets will say things like, oh, it's Sunday, I won't be around. Let's take the puppies on Friday. That might be okay, but not if the dog's not ready. I never take puppies early. So you have to have a backup plan because, you know, you are going to run into situations where there may not be the, your normal vet not, may not be around. You have to have a plan B. Plan B might be an emergency C-section at a hospital. They can be awfully expensive. I'm not crazy about those, but it can be done. All right. Um, so this is a bit off subject. We'll handle it real quickly. Beats by jerks. Yes. Have you ever had a dog that comes in the heat once a year? Yes. Quite not unusual at all, especially in smaller dogs. Yep. You know, lots of dogs, they're like clockwork. Every six months they come in the heat. Some it's every nine months. Some it might be a year. Some it could be longer than that. Just don't get in a hurry on this. It's, it's, it's not the end of the world. So uh, just give them some time. Um, all right. Uh, Brifford Great Danes, whelping question. In natural birth, how long before you intervene after puppies are born? Um, right away. We don't hang around on this. I mean, you know... Maybe the mum doesn't like you doing this, but I've never been in that situation. And I've had lots of live births because we used to raise labs a long time ago. And uh, we were always there for the live births. And we'd always, the moment the puppies were born, we'd take the puppy away. We'd get the umbilical cord tied off. We'd get the puppy dried off. We'd get the puppy that's taking its first breath. And then we'd put it on mum. And we'd put it on mum while the next, while she was working on having the next puppy. And then while the next puppy was being born, we might take all the puppies that were born and stick them in the incubator so we've got clear space while mom takes care of having this next puppy. Okay. So Inbox talking about this uh, litter that she had. Uh, she had a natural birth, one came, and then I had to rush her to the hospital. Well, I don't know the details on this as to what happened to you. I mean, sometimes you can have a puppy that's born early for, because it's necrotic or whatever, and uh, it can then bring on the whole um, um, whelp early. So those things can happen. All you can do in those situations is get on with it. I mean, you can't put them back inside. But if she's having puppies, she's having puppies. Now, I have been in a situation before where I had a, actually it was Cody, had a dog that produced a puppy about five days early. And it was actually a dead puppy. Uh, and uh, we didn't have a C-section because we knew we were way early. And then she just calmed down for the next four days and then started to go into labor and we did a C-section and the rest of the puppies were fine. It was actually eight or nine puppies in that litter. One puppy was dead, the rest of them were fine. Uh, puppy dosage for a Tarotzadil. Um, so Tarotzadil is a product that you use. You can buy it at horserace.com. It's great for a coccidia prevention of puppies with coccidia. Normally what you use, the normal product to use for coccidia, and by the way, coccidia is, a, is a, a parasite that infects puppies, intestines. It tends to cause a loose mucousy, maybe blood flex stool. It is important that you get it under control because puppies can get in trouble through dehydration. And so the normal process for this would be use Albon for like five to seven days. Um, I and a lot of you have had better luck with Tarotzazil, which is an off-label use. It's actually a horse product. Um, you can buy it at horserace.com. And uh, I don't remember the dosage. I think it's 0.2 of a cc for every uh, pound of weight, I believe. But you need to Google that. I don't like giving out dosages because, number one, I'm not a vet. And number two is I might get it wrong. I don't want you coming back and complaining to me if I gave you the wrong information. So anytime anybody, including me, is giving you dosage, I highly recommend that you double up and get on Google and make sure you agree with the dosage because you can get it wrong. Uh, is it a good idea for your dog to have a C-section after you know that it's pregnant? Yes, if it's a French Bulldog, for sure. Why? Because French Bulldogs and some other breeds have small hips and big heads, and that's the recipe for getting a puppy stuck. So, you know, there's some dogs like Labradors and big dogs where German Shepherds, you know, we very rarely have C-sections. Normally they can stop pumping puppies out. They've got big hips. Um, but, you know, if you look at the size of puppies when they're born, 
The size of a French Bulldog puppy and the size of a German Shepherd puppy is not a lot different. Typical size for a French Bulldog puppy is something around 7 to 10 ounces, whereas, you know, um, a German Shepherd uh, might have puppies that are, you know, 10 to 14 ounces. The dog might weigh 70, 80 pounds versus 20 pounds for a French Bulldog. It'd be almost four times the size, but the puppies aren't four times the size. It makes it really easy for them to have puppies. Not so in smaller dogs, and specifically French Bulldogs and Bulldogs. Big heads, small hips, C-section. If you don't do that, you're likely run into problems, especially if you've got a small girl that was bred to a big dog. Or, it doesn't sound like it, but if you have a small litter, if you've got a big litter, you tend to have smaller puppies in the litter because they don't have as much nutrition. But when you have a one or two puppy litter, you really can get a big puppy in there. They tend to come later, which means they're more developed, and those are really likely to get stuck. So I don't muck around with this. Best calorie builder for puppies, food. Food, 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 good quality food. I mean, the first thing would be, you know, mum's milk. You're not gonna get them onto anything other than mum's milk till they're at least three and a half to four weeks old. Got a large litter? Mum can get really pulled down. You can supplement that with goat's milk. Escalac is a product you can buy at your vet, which is basically exactly the same thing. There are things like NutraCal that you can give for kind of a quick energy booster, but they're not going to be really much of an, a calorie producer. Now, puppies, they need milk, and they need goat's milk or mum's milk. And so now if mum's not producing milk, you can try giving her fenugreek uh, seed that can help with milk production. Uh, you can absolutely start bottle feeding. And by the way, I brought my little puppy care kit with me because there's some things here that you should absolutely have. And so one of the things that I see is that the vets tend to have these tiny little bottles for cats and squirrels and supposedly dogs with little tiny little nipples on them. Throw them away. Go get a good old human baby bottle with a zero to three month and silicone nipple on it. This is great. It looks big, but I promise you it's not. Even little bitty puppies can get that nipple in their mouth and go to town on it. So what are the things to do when you're getting your first bottle? When you've loaded it up with milk and you turn it upside down, make sure it's not just streaming out milk because that'll flood a puppy. It's quite normal for it to be dripping a little bit, especially after you've turned it upside down and waited about 10 seconds because the air above it gets warmed up by the milk and that produces pressure that can start forcing some of the milk out. So if that happens, turn it upside down, get some air in it and try it again, and it shouldn't drip, but maybe you know, a drip every few seconds. That's what you want. If you, if you cannot get milk out of it, the way to make a hole in this is to go get yourself a, uh, a, a needle or, or a safety pin. Heat the safety pin up with a, with a um, you know, gas lighter so it's red hot, and then plunge it in there and pull it out. And that doesn't split it, it makes for a nice little neat hole. That works really well. Don't just buy one of these nipples, go buy a pack of three because you're going to have a nipple that doesn't work, you've got a replacement. You don't want to have to work with crappy equipment, especially since this is just a couple of bucks, nothing more than that. So, yep, um, let's have a look here. So, uh, Rose says, thanks for the videos, it really helps me prepare. Good. Um, Oh, someone's saying they've got the best fluffies we've ever seen. Well, thank you. Well, we do have nice fluffies. We've got really nice dogs. Here's something else. Structure, 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 structure. You hear Tammy talking about this all the time. You know, color's wonderful. Color, you know, can make for some interesting puppies. But only if your dogs have got good structure. So if you're getting your first dog, choose a dog with good structure. Pay a bit more money to have a dog that looks like the breed standard. It's not too big. Its legs aren't too long. It doesn't have you know, crazy massive ears. It doesn't, if it's a French Bulldog, it doesn't have much of a tail. Um, you know, it's got a short back, it's got shorter legs. I mean, look for structure, and those are probably one of the best things that you can do to get started in structure. And then look for the same thing as a stud dog, and marry the two together. You know, if you've got a smaller girl, I would be choosing a smaller stud dog. I like smaller stud dogs anyway. I like smaller Frenchies anyway. Breed standards, 27 pounds. I'd like to see dogs that are less than that when they're fully grown. I have an almost five week old pups, mum, so this is from Amy R. I have almost five week old pups. By the way, good job on just asking questions about pups. I like this, thank you. It makes it better for people who come back 
tomorrow or the next day where they can look at a video and realize what the video is about. This video that will be posted after we've done the live is going to be about puppies. And that way people have an idea about what they're going to be looking at. So she has a dog that is, uh, she's been raising, uh, she has a, 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 a almost five weeks old puppy. Mum will feed every four hours but doesn't like to stay with them. Is that okay? Also, my vet said not to vaccinate till eight weeks. I vaccinated the mum uh, and dad way before eight weeks. Okay, so let's handle these one at a time. So the first one is, if you've got puppies that you're bottle feeding and they're now five weeks old, I would be transitioning them by the time they're four weeks, I'd be starting them on puppy mush. I'd get them off mum. You can still be with mum and you can supplement their food by having both mum and mush, but the sooner that you can get them onto kind of a slurry, so what we use would be Royal Canines Puppy Moose mixed with some um, goats, warm goat's milk to make a slurry, a gravy out of it. And give them that and see how they do with it. The sooner you can get them on something that's a bit more solid than just straight milk, the quicker they'll start putting weight on. And the less load it is on mum, especially with a big litter. Big litters tend to hammer mum. I mean, they look just awful after about three or four weeks, getting really skinny, their backbone... Or seven. We don't play the game you're playing, which is to feed them every four hours. I'm not crazy about that solution. Uh, I think it can potentially bait, break the bond with mum, which is one of the things that you're experiencing in this situation. Um, you know, you, you say here that so she doesn't want to be around them very much. Our mum and babies are together 24-7 from the moment they come back from the C-section until such time as we decide they're fully weaned. And when we go through the weaning process, we'll still put mum and babies together at night but they probably won't be with each other during the daytime as we get this weaning process sorted out over the next five to seven days. So um, what can you do here? If she doesn't want to be with the babies and she hasn't been with the babies, I don't think you're going to fix this. I think the solution is just to get them weaned, and I think that's what your next process is. Um, your audio cut out. Okay, let's have a look and see what happened here. So somebody's complaining about my audio. Uh, I'm not sure why. But we will now try another microphone. So, no audio is no good. Let's see if this fixes the problem. We'll turn this one off. All right. So, somebody gives me a thumbs up if they can hear audio. Uh, sounds okay now. Back on. Good. All right. So, it looks like the audio is working. We'll put this thing back on to me. And uh, thanks for letting me know. There we go. Hopefully uh, that will fix the, the audio problem. All right, let's get back to the questions here. We've got to find them. Okay. Uh, CY3 in puppies. So what's CY3? CY3 is cisternin. I forget the exact name for it. Basically it is um, a protein that's in the urine that can cause stones. So dogs with it can get stones in their bladder and that can cause a lot of pain and grief. I've never had an experience with it. I've never had a dog that I was aware of had this problem. Um, so what do you do? I mean, first off, if you've got a dog that's got two copies of it, you've got to be aware of it. Maybe you can change a diet on the dog to help this situation. That's certainly what you could do with human beings. Maybe you can do things that give things that are a bit more acidic in their food. The kind of thing that we do for human beings would be... Um, Things like apple cider vinegar, um, um, oh, I can't think of that damn, not blackcurrant juice, but, you know, that, that kind of juice is more acidic. Maybe you could put that in the water and help the situation. Of course, if you've got a dog that's got a single copy of it and you breed to a dog that doesn't have that, then you only have one copy and it shouldn't afflict the puppies. So, uh, but exactly what you do, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Um... Sounds back on good. So somebody here, GSC Masses says, been watching you for a long time. Been raising puppies for 17 years. I've always learned something from you. I have a lot of big litters because I get the timing right. That's right. So that's another thing. Decent sized litter. What's the precursor of decent sized litter? Get the timing right. 
getting the technique right, getting good quality semen if it's having shipped, those are all things that affect the size of your litter. If you get any of those things wrong, it's going to impact litter size or get none at all. So we don't want singletons, they suck, and we don't want no-shows. Sounds good. Okay, good deal. Um, all right, so let's talk about some other things here. People are asking about uh, things that you should be checking on puppies. Weigh them every day. Very important. So what do we use? Comes in our puppy care kit. Just good old kitchen scales. Nothing fancy at all. Put a bowl on this. Put the puppies on this. We weigh puppies from the moment they come home. and We, we uh, figure out how to identify the puppies by markings, or you can put some paint their toes, you can look for shapes of patches on their body, you can put collars on them, but you want to be able to identify all the puppies and know what their weights are on a daily basis. So what are you going to see? Well, typically you'll lose half an ounce the first 24 hours. That's not alarming, that's normal, but not any more than that. And then they should stabilize. So the first 24 hours, lose half an ounce. The next day, stay the same weight they were, they were born, and then start gaining half an ounce every day. So if you're seeing the whole litter gaining half an ounce a day, Puppies are quiet, generally you know, sleeping a lot of the time, not crying, um, then you're in the, going on the right track. If you've got one of those puppies that's not gaining weight, that's an that's a obvious sign that something's not working right. And that's where you need to step in because the sooner that you take charge and be proactive about this, the less downhill that puppy goes. And look, be aware of the weight of these puppies. You know, if you've got a litter of puppies, and most of the puppies weigh between eight and 10 ounces, those aren't particularly fragile puppies, not in French bulldog world anyway. But if you've got a puppy that's like five and a half ounces or less, that is a puppy you really want to pay attention to because that one cannot afford to lose very much. You've got to remember that puppies do not have a, a lot of extra reserve. They can get cold quickly and get in trouble, then they stop eating and then they go downhill. If puppies don't get fed on a regular basis, they, they don't store any energy as fat, they get in trouble very quickly. So. You want to make sure that your puppies are gaining weight, and if they're not, then you know, step in, you can bottle feed, which we showed you that. Of course, one other thing that everybody absolutely should have in their arsenal, in their puppy care kit, is a feeding tube. There's, these things are dirt cheap. The problem with feeding tubes, well, what is a feeding tube? Basically, a feeding tube is a method of being able to make a puppy swallow the tube so it goes down into their stomach, so you can then attach a syringe to this and give them milk. How much do you feed them? Whatever they weigh in ounces, you feed in mils every three hours. 10 ounce puppy, 10 mils every three hours, right. So this is a lifesaver. The problem with this is most vets don't carry them as crazy as it is. You can buy those at My Breeder Supply. I think Cody has a kit of a couple of them with syringes and they're not very expensive, maybe 20 bucks or less. You need it. You can't get this when you need it. When you need it, it's always gonna be on a Saturday night when everything's closed and that is too late in some cases. Don't muck around. Get yourself some feeding tubes, put them in a drawer somewhere, or put them better yet, put them in your puppy care kit so you've got them. And then, you know, what we feed is, this comes to puppy care kit, is uh, goat's milk. So this is Mainberg's goat's milk. Espelac's the same thing. Any of these things are fine. Okay. Um, and I was going to bring this out for another reason. I don't remember what it was now, but that's fine. Let's see what else people are asking. Um, oh, somebody had a Mando Bellatrix litter. They look great. Full fluffies. Yeah, okay, so Mando, of course, is uh, our full fluffy uh, moral stud. He's a beautiful dog. And I'm thinking this is Bellatrix. This is a litter of, of uh, uh, a full a litter. You got one of our puppies, so a litter of 10 full fluffies. And I think Bellatrix was in that litter. So mind that, she would be now about two and a half, three years old. So maybe this is a first or second litter, but... Uh, Congratulations. And by the way, just talking about this, what Cody's doing, first off, Cody's dramatically reduced his stud price as of uh, any breedings after January 1. And uh, he gives you future half price breedings to any female that you produce with a pairing with one of his dogs for the life of that dog, which you can then either give away if you rehome the dog or keep that dog and take advantage of those half price breedings. So, uh, and then um, so anybody who buys one of our dogs gets the half price breedings and anybody who produces any females, they get half price breedings. And it's not a one time event, it is forever. So if you have a, a dog and you give that dog to somebody else as a female, it was offer breeding from one of our studs, they can come back to us and get half price breedings until the cows come home. All right. 
Uh, Javier says, my puppy has giardia since November the 26th. He's not been ready to get rid of it with Panicure and Metro and other things. Um, okay, yes, so this is, can be a problem. So what we're talking about here is giardia is a protozoa that affects guts of dogs. It's very, very common. Um, all dogs have a small amount of this in their gut and it can get out of control, especially young dogs who have, don't have a fully developed immune system, dogs that got stressed, dogs that were doing fine that got shipped somewhere, has stressful time, those, they can develop you know, a bout of giardia. They can give it to other dogs, it's fairly infectious. Um, dogs get it by mucking around with somebody's poop, sniffing dogs' back ends, can potentially give a dog giardia. Um, what's the treatment? The normal treatment for giardia is metronidazole, that uh, you then give for like 10 days. It's an antibiotic, fairly rough on the puppy, but that is the normal treatment. And you may have to do a few routes of this. Now, you're having problems. There are other treatments out there that you can treat with as well. So any time that I have a dog that's having problems, one of the things I do right away is I always give three days of safeguard. Just as a normal, I, I worm all of my dogs, puppies in particular, six weeks and beyond every two weeks, and if they have any kind of an intestinal problem, I'll give them three days of safeguard. Even if I've done it a week ago, I'll give them three days of safeguard. And then I will start with something like metronidazole to see whether we can't fix the problem. But it can be a problem sometimes to get rid of it. Then they can get reinfected from other puppies. You've got to clean all the poop up because they can get reinfected from poop that's laying around. So it can be a battle sometimes. But, uh, and then it can be misdiagnosed as well. You, know, you can misdiagnose something as being um, giardia and it's in fact something else. So you've got to make sure you've got the diagnosis right. Okay. Uh, Dale Taylor, do you always have to C-section every litter or just some months? We C-section every litter. We don't muck around with this. Um, now I mentioned before about you know, why. French bulldogs, small heads, big heads. Uh, you never know what's coming down the pike. And if you get caught out, you can lose puppies, you can lose a litter, you can lose mum. I wouldn't muck around with this. There's just not much reason to. The biggest probably objection that people have to C-sections are the cost of it. And you can really make a difference on what you're paying for a C-section by doing some research beforehand. We sell a portable incubator. It's on mybridisplay.com. Plugs it in your car. Tammy and I typically go for a trip that's an hour to an hour and a half for a C-section. And the reason for that is, is that we can go to somebody who has done lots of C-sections. We know them. They'll do things after hours for us, and we're in that six to eight hundred dollar price range, not in that two thousand. Or if you're on the California, you might be paying six thousand dollars for emergency C-section. Crazy prices. So yes. Um, all right. So the answer is what we do. What do I do when a newborn puppy is born but is gasping for air? The reason it's gasping for air is it's got fluid in its lungs. You've got to get the fluid out of its lungs. And so how do you do that? Well, the first thing would be that you need an aspiration bowl. And here's an aspiration bowl that comes in a puppy care kit. You squeeze it, let it go, put it in the puppy's mouth and their noses. Squeeze it, let it go, and it sucks all the mucus out. So that's the first thing to do. The next thing to do is shake the puppy down. So shaking a puppy down means you've got to let gravity help, patting it on its back, roughing its back up, facing its head towards the ground, and get it drained out. It's gasping because it's got muck in its lungs still and it can't get a good breath. And then John Miller says the Nuzi Poo electric aspirator works great. Absolutely, you bet. So, you know, an electric aspirator makes life a little bit easier. Nothing wrong with doing that either. That's absolutely right. Okay. Uh, let's have a look here. Whoops. Oh dear. Got off those things here. Um, so, someone's asking here, Shipmate Kit, do we get the newer version of Shipmate Canister? Uh, the answer on this is, is that I think we've got both kinds still. There's no difference. It's exactly the same electronics. The only difference is the canister. And the silver one is just a tad bigger. And the reason we went for a slightly bigger flask is because there's a bit more room for the D-cell battery in the lid. It makes it a little easier to put the lid on. But functionality is no different whatsoever at all. So I think Cody's moving towards the newer ones now. I think he's got rid of most of the other ones. But it won't make a shed of difference which one you get. They're both going to work equally well. Um, all right, sounds on, good. Right, so let's talk about, let's talk about uh, medications for puppies. What are you typically going to give? So, and then somebody asked about shots. I didn't answer that in their two-part questions. Let's handle the shots part first. 
So there's going to be different ideas about when you give shots. The thing about shots is you can't start them too early, you don't want to start them too late, and you don't want them to have too close or too far apart. I know it sounds complicated and it is a little bit. So you are not going to get a single consistent answer from everybody you ask this question to, including your vets. This is what we do. We give our first shots at six weeks. We wait three weeks and give another shot at nine weeks. We wait three weeks and give a shot at 12 weeks if the puppies have not left. And then they get their rabies shot at 16 weeks. Now, if you go outside that, you know, if you wait five weeks for your next shot, you probably have to start the whole process again. Uh, and what's going on here is this is a, when, you, when the puppies are born, they get natural immunity from mum through the colostrum. That wanes off and it has to have gone off enough that they don't battle the shot they get at six weeks so that it then generates a response so they then get antibodies. And if you do it too close to when they were got colostrum from mum, it won't be effective. If you take it too long, the puppies might suffer from something that's, uh, you know, parvo or something like that. So for us, it's every three weeks. Uh, and be consistent about it. Now, your, your vet might say it every two weeks. That's fine. Uh, but just, you know, something between two and four weeks is the spread. And it's not any more or less than that, I can tell you that. So for us, it's every three weeks. We've never had a problem with this. Why do you do this? Because there's a number of things that puppies can get. I mean, the big one would be things like uh, parvo. Remember, just because you've given your puppy a shot at six weeks does not mean that puppy can not, now not get parvo. It does not mean that. It means it has a more refined uh, autoimmune system that gives it a better chance of battling whatever may be coming around. So you can do five in one, six in one, seven in one shots. There's you know, distemper, bordetella, kennel cough. There's all kinds of things that can be put in with this. And depending on what your environment is, you might want to have a seven in one versus a five in one. If you're raising puppies in your house, they're really not exposed to other dogs, five in one's probably fine. But be consistent. And remember as well, these vaccines have to be kept cold. If you're coming home from the vet with vaccines, make sure they give you a bag with some ice blocks in it. And when you get home, get those things into the refrigerator. Do not leave them in your car, do not leave them out because they will not be effective. And you could even get in trouble with this. You know, not in trouble legally, but in trouble where the vaccine's not even working properly, or maybe even worse, cause problems. So, so um, you've got to be kept cold. If you're buying puppies online, which is what we typically do, you now we'll buy 25 shots at a time, then you have to pay the extra money to get those coming overnight in a uh, polished iron shipping box with ice, because they can't get hot. Um, Shelf life on these things is probably a year if they're in a the refrigerator. So, you know, you can get 25. You now, if you've got eight puppies and they each need three shots, you need 24 shots, get 25. It's going to save you a lot of money. I mean, when we go to our vet to have shots done, I think that by the time it's all told, it's costing 50 bucks or more per puppy because they've got to administer the shot. They're probably going to want to do some kind of an exam they're going to charge you for. And, hey, Tammy, what, what are we paying for when we go to... Uh, Dr. Mitt, do you know what it was for shots? Yeah, you can buy the shots at your vet and bring them home. Yeah, so that's so I'm glad Tammy's here, see? Can you come and say hi? No. No. Okay, all right. Tammy's not going to say hi. So Tammy's just, yeah, that's why I like to have Tammy here for these. So Tammy says there's another good reason why we don't go to the vet for shots. Guess where sick dogs go? The vet. The vet. I'm waiting for somebody to say something. They go to the vet. So this is the best place to go get a dog infected is at the vet. I, mean, I could tell you a horror story. We had some labs a long time ago and the whole lot got parvo because we went to the vet and there was a dog with parvo. We brought parvo home on nose us and the whole lot got parvo and those dogs were too young to have uh, immunity and they all died from it. It was a very, 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 very uh, horrible time. 30 years ago, you know, more, yeah. So the point here is, is that you can quite easily administer. The one thing that you cannot administer and get a tag for is rabies shot. So you do want to have a rabies shot that does need to be administered by your vet. And look, there's good reasons to go to your vet occasionally with your dogs. For us, whenever dogs leave us, prior to them going on a trip anywhere or leaving us, they are going to have a full vet checkup for eyes, for ears, for heart, for lungs, for legs, for knees, for fecal infections, all of that stuff, you know.
But there's what we do when we do take them, we keep them in the car, in the crate, until <clears throat> the vet is ready to see them. And then when the vet's ready to see them, we take them in the crate, lay a pee pad down on their table, even though they do wipe it and clean it for you, I still put a pee pad down so each puppy that's taken out, it's on that pee pad, not on that table. And then <clears throat> I, after he's seen them all, I throw the pee pad away, take the babies off in the, in the crate again, and put them straight into the car. There you go. Not let anybody so what is the, see them. what is the one place on the vet's office that you're most likely to have a problem? Right. The door. Yeah, the, the handle, the handle yeah, going in there. So have your wipes. Your have a wipe with you. I mean, I know you know you look kind of a bit of a nerd when you do this. But it's, but, it's the what if. You know, I think it's a good idea to have a handy wipe and wipe the handle off as you touch it. I mean, yeah, I. Yeah. So you know, I think it's just a good idea. I mean, people are going to look at you like you're a bit, you know, a bit nuts. But I mean, you know, you never know. You never know. And uh, so we we are pretty careful about this. All right. Um. All right, let's see, someone's saying, uh, let me go back through these. Best age for puppies to go home. My, my vet says 10 to 12 weeks, no earlier. Well, I like that. I mean, so, you know, there are some rules on this. The, I don't think the AKC, I don't think if you're shipping a puppy through cargo, which we don't use, I don't think they can be younger than 10 weeks old. That's our cutoff, and the reason for that is we want to give them a nine-week shot, and we want to have a few days after that before they travel to make sure there's no adverse reaction to that. We do not want a puppy flying somewhere with an adverse reaction to a shot. Our rule is 10 weeks or older. Um, the problem you've got here is, is the older they are, the people are coming for their dogs, and they want to have them as the young puppies and not, you know, not older dogs. But I think that, uh, you know, let's say my next-door neighbor bought a dog from me, and that puppy could probably leave at eight weeks because it's next door. And if there's a problem, they can come back and see me. We'd never, ever ship a puppy anywhere at eight weeks, personally. We wouldn't. No. But there are people who do. But we... We, we, like we to get our second shot down those puppies yeah. that we feel better about. Right. It. Yes. Yeah. A Renee, a Rochelle, Rochelle Renee yes. says she just joined. Uh, 46 Miller says, puppy had an eye bulge, went to the vet. She opened the corner of the eye up, not much drainage, did antibiotic cream. By the next day, the eye was open, was totally cloudy. This evening, the eye bled through the pupil. Oh dear, you have a problem. Oh, no. So what's that? So we have. I've seen this happen one time like that. I've had quite a few puppies that have developed an eye bulge over the years. Typically, it's one eye only, and presumably they've got some kind of an infection. It probably happens they went through the birth canal uh, because the the puppy's eye is closed shut. And what you see is one eye that's bulging quite a bit. And eventually that bulge, you can get, tease the corner of the eye, typically the outside of the eye, you can tease it open a little bit, rub your finger across the eye, and get some nasty pussy stuff out of there. And it will make the whole thing look a lot better and probably a lot more comfortable for the puppy. And if you can get that done, then get some tetra, teramycin, triple antibiotic cream, and see if you can get some of that in there as well. Now, Chanel had one puppy one time that had this, and when the eye opened up, the eye was all milky and ended up losing the eye. So, you know, you can end up with not a very good situation. What can you do about it? Not much. I mean, what, well, what can you do about it? You can get it open, you can get it flushed out, you can get the dog on antibiotics. So, if you've got a really big infection, you're worried about this, and I think Clavamox would make sense. But for us, it's always, except for that one time, it's always been fine with just getting the corner of the eye open, getting the muck out, and getting some teramycin in there. And the, typically, you'll see those eye bulges happening about day five or six, and by the time they're typically around day 10, the eyes are opened up anyway, and you can probably get them up, uh, opened up earlier than that. So typically you're fighting this for about three or four days before, uh, before the eyes open. So get on top of that as soon as you possibly can. And then if you're not sure... Um, um, yeah, so if you're not... Sh so this is, uh, Miller says, not an infection, new mum. Please, everyone, watch the new mums. So um, I I'm not sure what you're telling us, whether this was trauma or what happened here, because uh, there could be other reasons why an eye, the eye gets damaged. But um, you know, remember, if you've listened to my stuff and I haven't given you advice, or you don't like my advice, or you think that my advice is wrong, or you think there's another way to treat it, go do your research. Do not rely strictly on what I say, because I am not. I don't always get things right, and I always learn new stuff, and there's nothing wrong with going to a vet. I mean, I know it costs a bit of money, 
But even when you go to your vet, do the same thing you should be doing with me. That is, be a little bit critical and make sure that what you're being told makes sense. Always Google it. That's right, Tammy's out there saying always, always Google it. Yeah, always Google. Get a second opinion, a second opinion. Remember, Google's pretty good, but there's also a lot of wacky ideas on there. So just Do don't research. E yeah. Now, if you've got one person who's saying something that seems a bit whacked, it probably is. If you've got five people who are saying the same thing, it's probably good advice. Um, okay. Um, all right, so we were talking about medications for puppies. So let's talk about another thing, very typical thing puppies not pooping. So puppies not pooping could be a number of reasons. If you've got a fluffy puppy and it's got kind of a thicker hair, especially on its back end and around its tail, it can get caked up with poop, which can block the hole up and it can't poop. So how do you cope with that? Go eat yourself a, a warm, moist rag, warm rag, and just start working that cruddy stuff and get it out of the way. You can take a pair of scissors. You can clip the hair off on the back there around its tail so it's got a better path to poop. Those can, things can fix obstructions caused by caked poop. But that's the first thing. If a puppy's not pooping, make sure that it doesn't have cake pooped up. If it does, get rid of it. The next thing is mum is not stimulating the puppies very well. You can stimulate them with a, nothing more than a wet tissue that you rub on their back end and then you can make them pee and poop that way. If they are not pooping, puppies need to poop once a day, at least once a day. If they're not pooping, you don't see any evidence of any poop, or you've got a puppy that's got a hard belly and it's not pooping, you can go get an enema. And that is simply nothing more than a syringe, uh, warm water with a few drops of dishwashing soap. We use Dawn, but I don't think it's particularly magical, any kind of dishwashing soap. A few drops of dishwashing soap, suck that up to a syringe and gently squirt that up their butt. Don't use lots of force and don't do a lot of it. CC or two is plenty, especially in a small puppy. And uh, you can do that up to three times a day and get the puppy going. It works magically well. Once you get, so one of the things that you know, people worry about is if they start giving too many animals, it's going to get habit forming for the dog. I've never seen it happen. And I've had people who ask me about this, and I say, hey, look, you've got to, you've got to get these puppies pooping. And don't worry about them getting uh, stuck on only pooping when they've got stuff being squirted at their butt. Nobody ever calls me back and says, hey, my puppy now will only poop if I use the, an enema. So get them going, get them pooping. They'll be more comfortable. If they're not emptying their bowels, they will eventually get in trouble. So you've got to get their bowels going. Um, okay. How are we doing time-wise here? We're in it for 47 minutes. Oh, the person who talked about Miller, who talked about the eye, says, Mum may have kicked her with, the, uh, with her back foot. Yeah, so she so just wanted people to watch new mums. Yeah. Well, okay, so let's just talk about that for a second. You know, so one of the things that, that you know, whenever we come home with litter of puppies, we don't just pile all the puppies in there with mum, close up the crate and walk away. We introduce one puppy first to see how she reacts. Give her enough time to blow off her anesthesia if she's had a C-section. You, you know, if, if it's a short trip home, she just woke up from anesthesia 30 minutes ago, she's going to be groggy as all get out, she's going to be punch drunk. You can't expect her to really realize what's going on. You can get a puppy bit, or you can get a puppy rough with a puppy. So give her a chance to take this slowly. What Tammy does is she gets a puppy in her hand, and she gives that puppy so they can just get to the back end of that puppy so mum can sniffle on it and lick on it. And if she's not reacting very well to that, Tammy will go get some peanut butter and smear it on her bum and let mum lick that off. That works magically well. So you want to get her where she's accepting the first puppy, She's sniffled on it, she's licked on it, she hasn't growled at it, she hasn't tried to bite it, and you can get that puppy on her and she'll lay down and let that puppy nurse. And if she wants to keep getting up, get her out of the crate, get her onto a blanket on the floor, get her head in your lap, start stroking her head and get that puppy down. If she wants to get up, don't let her. Show her who's boss and show her what she needs to do. But first off, get the first puppy going before you introduce the next puppy. Now, in Millard's case, where you know, a pu puppy may have got stepped on by mum, look, those things can happen. The problem you've got here is you cannot spend 24-7 looking after these puppies. It's not your job and you just can't do it. All you can do is give a safe environment and make sure you've got a good start and pay attention to what's going on. And if there's some aberrant behavior going on, then you need to step in and we give a smack on the nose. Now, we, we, I, I don't like negative reinforcement. I much prefer to give positive reinforcement to our kids, our grandkids, and our dogs. But there's times 
when if a dog just is behaving in a really shitty manner right there and then, a good smack on the nose is not a bad thing to do. So don't be afraid to do that. Get your dog, and your dogs want to make you happy. They want to make you pleased, and you don't want aberrant behavior, and you want to get it nipped in the bud as quickly as you possibly can. One of the things that I do see is those of you who've got dogs that sleep on the bed with you, they are, don't quite, you know, they think they're a human being, and I think those dogs need to be put in the whelping environment a few days before they have puppies. So they realize they're not sleeping on the bed. They realize that they are going to be sleeping in this environment here. And what we do is we get a wire crate, 42 by 28 or 48 by 30 crate, and mum goes in that with a bedding in there, and she sleeps in that for a few days before she has the puppies. And she's in there for the next four weeks. And we put a blanket over the whole thing. They love being in there. It's never a problem. But you've got to get there, and you don't want to guess the day that they come home from a C-section where they're groggy, all of a sudden you put that in that environment, they're not sleeping on the bed anymore, and they're like, what the hell is going on? I'm supposed to be up there with you. So give them a chance to behave properly. So Dale Taylor says um, that uh, he had a litter, we had to suction the entire litter, and he had another litter, he didn't have to. Exactly right. And we don't very often have to use a suction bowl on puppies. I mean, when they're born, absolutely. So, you know, at the vet stops and the C-section is going on, they always get suction. But after that, typically, unless they've got problems, they don't need suctioning. Let's talk about, let's talk about milk aspiration, because that's something that really is something that's pretty significant, that, that a lot of you will or have had problems with this. So here's the scenario. You look down the puppies that are nursing on mum, and they've got milk just streaming out of their nose. What do you do? Well, not a lot. What we do is we'll mop that up with a paper towel and get that cleaned up. Uh, if they're nursing with a bottle, we'll stop nursing with a bottle and give them a chance to catch up. So you can regulate this if you're bottle feeding, but if they're nursing off mum, some puppies just got milk coming out of their noses. But one of the things that I do see going on that you do have control over is if you have separated mum and babies, put them in an incubator, for example, and you just introduce them to mum every three or four hours for feedings, then you take them away. There's two things that go on that aren't helping you. The first thing is that mum's milk has been building up over this three, four hour period because she hasn't been drained since the last feeding. And she then has bulged boobs, quite a bit of milk pressure, and milk starts to free flow out of the nipples very quickly. The puppies have not been fed for three or four hours. They get hungry just like you and me. They realize there's a feeding schedule. They're not stupid. They realize this right away, very first time they've been taken away, and they're like, hey, I know that I'm just going to get fed for a short amount of time, and I've got to battle all the other puppies around me, and I'm going to drink as much milk as I possibly can right now. So they do that. Milk streaming out of their noses. It's not what we do. Our puppies feed when they are ready. They're all under the pig row asleep. They wake up because another puppy may have bumped into them. They realize they'd like to get some food. They go find mum. They feed. Puppies go in shifts. Mum's with the babies all the time, there's no build-up of milk pressure, and the puppies, you know, it just, they regulate themselves. If you don't do that, you'll likely see this situation with milk running out of the noses, and that can lead to aspiration, that then leads to pneumonia that can lead to dead puppies. So, you know, we have not had a puppy die of milk inhalation in a long time, uh, but we have had it happen in the past, and that was before we had our heated welding system. So I'm a firm believer that the heated whelping system is a major contributor towards not having puppies uh, aspirating milk. Uh, let's have a look here. Someone's saying, there's, uh, got lots of questions here. And I'm, hey, if I don't answer your questions, I apologize. They're coming fast and far between, and so I can't get to all of them. Um, So, 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 so watch your videos, you say not to separate them. So then we, when would you separate puppies? Good question. Well, there are times I'd separate puppies from mum. Aberrant behavior on mum. Mum is just a shitty mother. She's not doing a good job. Maybe I've got to step in. Haven't had that happen in the longest time. In fact, Tammy's listening in the background there. Tammy, have we ever separated mum from uh, mum and babies because mum's being a shitty mother? Because I don't think we ever have. I I've never had a mama be shitty to our babies. No, never had that happen. We've had mums that have been shitty to start yeah. with. Yeah. That was just one that yes. we had, and she 
finally realized yes, that the, her mother instincts came in. And you taught her. Just in time. And you taught her. You taught her. <laughs> so when will you separate mums? So there's another reason you've got a really sick puppy. Sick puppies that are frail, that can't battle the other puppies to get nursing, they need to be separated out, stick them in an incubator, hand rear them, hand feed them, get them back to the weight of the other puppies, get them where they're active and healthy. And one good test for a puppy, by the way, stick your little finger in its mouth, and what should happen is, it should feel moist, should feel warm, and it should suckle. If there's no suckle reflex, you're gonna to have to tube feed that puppy because it's not gonna get fed. Another reason could be that a puppy is suckling but it has a cleft palate, you should have checked that at birth. Cleft palate puppies are very, very hard to get them to the point where that can be repaired. In fact, I've never succeeded. We don't ever try anymore. So if it's just a hair lip, that's completely fixable. That will not stop a puppy from nursing. But a hole in the roof of the mouth makes a hole between the mouth and the sinus cavity and the nose. They can't make a vacuum. They can't suckle. They can't get milk. Those puppies get in trouble. But the point here is, uh, you know, only separate your puppies if they are having problems getting beat up by other puppies because they're small or they're so weak they can't nurse. Those puppies probably need to be incubated with oxygen and uh, tube fed. But that's it. Um, got a puppy that's got an eye infection, it's closed up, I wouldn't separate them. I'd keep an eye on the other puppies and keep it cleaned up, but I wouldn't separate a puppy over that. So typically, if a puppy's got something in its gut that's causing problems, probably all the puppies have experienced this. You know, you're not probably gonna, it's not like bringing in a new puppy to your environment that needs to be quarantined for two weeks. That's not what's going on here. If one puppy's got it, you've probably all got it. They've all been getting the same food, the same milk supply. All right, so when we talk about milk supply, let's quickly talk, touch on mastitis. This is another one that can get people in trouble. And I've only had this happen to me once where I couldn't fix it, where it actually erupted, and that's because I didn't know what I was doing. What can happen is mum has a small litter, a lot of milk, it's not getting drained, the top boobs that aren't favored by the puppies don't get uh, used very much, and they can get clappered up, hot, lumpy, and hard, and that can then get an abscess, and that can cause a big problem. And if you don't fix it, then it can erupt, the, the mother can get a, an infection, can get uh, blood poisoning, and can die. So, get on those. If you see every day, especially for the first two weeks of your puppies, check all of her boobs, make sure they're pliable and soft and they're not hot, hard, and lumpy. If they are, get them drained, get a towel on them, get a wet towel on them, express them by hand, put a puppy on them and get puppies working on them, get the nipples unblocked, get them flowing and get the milk flowing. If you don't do that, you're likely to get into trouble. Um, okay, what are we up to? We're up to 50, we're up almost an hour. I think we're gonna call this done. Um, Next week, what are you gonna talk about? Well, I don't know. I um, think um, dog diseases that you can catch, or the, I mean that the dogs can catch, that would be a good one. So Tammy's saying that maybe the next uh, live that we do here, maybe the middle of the week, we might battle general diseases of dogs. But here's your opportunity. You can get in the comments, you know, you can go look at the comments on this after this has been posted here in about another 15 minutes when it stopped. And you can put questions in there about things that were not answered, which you'd like to ask, or just give me a theme and we'll see whether we can get a common theme and answer those questions. So, okay, so uh, for those of you who have participated in this, we really appreciate you being here uh, to ask questions. For those of you who asked questions didn't get answered, I apologize, um, but I do try to answer questions. So if you ask a question on, on YouTube, I will text something to you. So again, uh, I hope this was useful and uh, lots of great questions. And everybody kept it to the theme, and I like that because now we can make that available to other people. They get an idea of what they're looking at. And uh, someone's asking about split heat for breeding, and we're going to answer that next time. Um, anyway, there we go. Again, thanks for watching. Everybody enjoy the rest of their evening, and uh, have fun with the puppies. Bye, buddy. <laughs>